Well, the 4th of July is coming up, and the major fireworks may not be in the sky, but may actually be financial, metaphorically speaking. Of course, Lobel Tigre of the Independent Speculator is here to describe exactly what he means by that. Lobo, welcome back. We're going to get into the fireworks discussion in just a bit, but I want to talk about gold first. Now, you sent me a pretty interesting chart over the weekend. This. So let me just describe what this is. So at the top, we've got uh, the DXY index. In the middle, on the right-hand side, is a gold chart, and on the bottom is the U.S. 10-year. So this chart was as of Thursday's close, um, if I'm not mistaken. And it shows that uh, more or less gold has responded more to the dollar index than the 10-year yield. Can you, can you describe uh, what we're seeing and how you're reading this chart, Lobo? Sure. Well, this is early days research here because this is a new thing, and that's what makes it really rather interesting. Also, this was actually Friday morning, uh, not okay. Thursday night. It's Friday morning, but before the close. But what's really striking about that is you and I have spoken, and a lot of people, you, you listen to people who talk about what's going on with gold, and the number one explanatory variable that people come up with, other than manipulation, of course, is uh, real interest rates. And since CPI only changes monthly on a day-to-day -day basis, you look at the benchmark 10-year as a substitute or proxy for real rates. And we have seen just almost like a, <laughs> as close to a one-to-one -one relationship as exists financially. These charts look like mirror images. The 10-year and the price of gold on a day-to-day -day basis do this Rorschach thing. Uh -huh. But in the last week or two, we've started to see that starting to come unglued. And on that particular day, that particular time, it's really striking how you can really see uh, the DXY, the dollar going vertical, and gold tanking at the exact same time. Meanwhile, rates, the 10-year, which has been the most explanatory variable, is just kind of waffling sideways. That is different. And my interpretation of that is that I think the traders, uh, traders, not traitors, though some people see them as the same, on Wall Street in London who, who uh, trade these futures contracts are starting to really get a clue that you know maybe uh, inflation is going to be a little bit more than the powers that Bree are telling us. And maybe it's not good enough to go with the CPI figures that come out once a month. So you'll have um, not just the broad expectations, but I, I think financial players are starting to discount the uh, the data they're getting just from from nominal rates and they're starting to factor that in and what do you do if you can't use the tenure anymore what do you plug into your robot your ai there that trades for you if you can't use the tenure well i think the next best thing is to go directly to the dollar and the dxy is uh you know data that you can plug in so we might see more algo trading uh going directly off the dollar okay Let's go back to this chart one more time. So yeah, you're right. The 10 year has been, well, it, during during that time period, at least it was trading sideways. Now, uh, are you suggesting low? Because we did have a nice run up in gold over the last uh, couple of weeks up to 200 bucks, um, all the way to $1,900. Are you suggesting that most of that strength came from dollar weakness or higher inflation expectations from traders? I would um, say the latter. We okay. have had the dollar testing that 90 level, which is a, a multi-year low. And if it breaks significantly below that, a lot of uh, Forex types tell me that will be major. I uh, hadn't done that yet. But another thing, we don't have the chart here, but David, but if you look at uh, the nominal tenure over the last three months and gold over the last three months, you'll see that it's sort of similar to what we have here in that the tenure has pretty much fluctuated with high volatility sideways, hadn't gone anywhere, you know, between, you know, one six, sometimes up to one seven, sometimes below. Uh, but gold has gone up. It's gone consistently up. The day-to-day -day movements have mostly reflected the 10-year until recently. Uh, but if you look at the bigger picture over the last months, actually you'll see that gold is up substantially while rates haven't really changed. So this fits in the, the story that I'm uh, beginning to, to put some credence in, that traders, the people that, um, not you and I going down to the coin shop and what we pay for gold and silver, but the traders on these mm -hmm. futures contracts that set the prices that are most often quoted are starting to change oh. their metrics. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what you said about uh, gold responding more to inflation expectations, because uh, what you just said there, that the, the ten-year was more or less flat over the last couple of weeks, but gold has gone up. 
So real interest rates is just the nominal rate minus the inflation expectation. So nominal rate is, uh, of course, we know that real interest rates is negatively correlated with gold. So if nominal rates are flat, then inflation expectations must have ticked up. And so real interest rates must have gone down, driving gold up. So that, that narrative certainly does make sense to me. And actually, I think you're right, Lobo, because if you take a look at the TIP ETF, something we've talked about before, the, the Treasury Inflation Protection Security a measure, a proxy for inflation expectations, that's been steadily ticking up. Um, that leads me to my next question, Lobo, which is, this is an interesting phenomenon that I've observed, which is that gold over the last five to 10 years, if you, if you chart gold, I'll, I'll pull up this chart here, gold versus the TIP ETF has had a very, very strong correlation However, gold versus the CPI, which is a backward-looking um, data set measuring uh, historic inflation that happened the previous month, that correlation actually is, is, is very low. There's, there's very little consistent measurable inf uh, correlation between inflation, CPI data, and gold over the long term. Um, take the 80s, for example. We had very high inflation in the 80s, but uh, gold went down. So... Anyway, my, my point is, why, why is it that gold doesn't correlate well with historic inflation, but correlates perfectly with inflation expectations, which is forward-looking? So it's interesting that you pick the 80s. All right, let, let's take this one piece at a time. Um, if you look at the last 10 years, we say that they've been largely disinflationary. There hadn't been actually any real deflation, but it's been disinflationary, not much inflation to speak of. Yeah. And if you disregard the noise and you look at 1910 or 1905 gold where we're at as you and I speak and the peak of 1900 uh, almost 10 years ago in 2011 well gold's, gold's gone sideways you could argue that gold's gone sideways inflation's gone sideways we're actually screen out the noise and they're on par um, but the 70s were the most inflationary period since the dollar was divorced from gold in 71 by tricky dick nixon and the story there, I think, fits in what you're saying. It's, it wasn't so much how much prices went up today that made people run out and buy gold or silver. In my case, it was silver at the time with my, my lawnmower boy money. Um, but it was the, the expectation, the understanding that, oh, my gosh, inflation's out of control. These headlines, these nightmare headlines about how inflation was going to the moon and we weren't going to, you know, it didn't seem possible. The Fed couldn't control it, you know, pre-Volcker. It, it seemed out of control. Nobody knew what was going on. So that fear drove a lot of people into gold and silver that who wouldn't otherwise. So it was, it was very strongly the expectation, not just the reality. Mm -hmm. If you look at just the numbers and correlate them, you'll get a different thing than if you correlate the expectation. And that's, broadly speaking, I think that makes perfect sense. I've, I've often described gold as a fear barometer. Right? People want to look at the supply and demand, how much is coming out of the mines and how much is being made into jewelry and all that stuff. And I think that's an erroneous way to try to predict the price of gold. Because as you and I know, most of the gold that's ever been mined is sitting around in refined form in vaults somewhere or another. So the yeah. potential supply can always completely swamp any industrial or jewelry or other demand out there if suddenly everybody decided to sell. So the psychology is paramount here. The, right. the keeps it in balance is how much people fear. And that's why I see it as a fear barometer. And that's why gold is more closely related to expectations okay. uh, in terms of big price moves. Sorry, one more thing real quick. For sure. Um, but if you look at the big picture, like, you know, 10 year, whatever you look at the biggest picture that we can of the new monetary regime since 1971, when the gold uh, standard was formally, finally, completely killed. You know, gold's gone from 35 bucks an ounce to here we are above 1900. And the dollar's purchasing power has gone from whatever it was to whatever it is now, but quite the opposite. So if you look at that biggest picture, I think you can still see that gold does actually correlate long, long term with inflation. The destruction okay. of the purchasing value of the dollar is captured mm -hmm. in the price of gold today. Yeah, that was my, okay, so this is one interpretation of these charts. And uh, let me know if you agree or disagree with this point. Um, I think I know your answer, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, so now, it, it, the, the way I see it is that there, there may be a misconception amongst the marketplace that gold is an inflation hedge. And so everybody still expects gold to be an inflation hedge, which is why it correlates perfectly with inflation expectations. Yet 
no one's really bothered to look at the data. If you just take just plot gold next to medium term inflation, that correlation again, as we talked about, is not uh, is not very high. So maybe it might be a it might it might be a while before the marketplace realizes this, but it won't happen right away. How would anyway? Would you agree or disagree with that statement? I think I don't know what kind of math you did, David, uh, and we're not going to dissect it now here on camera. But I, I do think that the time frame is pertinent here. And sure, it's, yeah. um, it's, I mean, like I just said, if you look at 1971 to today and you look at the purchasing power of the dollar and you look at the price of gold and they're like an X on the chart, they're actually somewhat curved X, but still uh, opposite. And clearly there is a relationship there that is non-zero. Uh, now, how, how that plays out, I think is, or what's really pertinent, like it, we're not gonna have an intellectual discussion about exactly what that means. We're trying to be helpful to people out there making investment decisions. And here's how I see it. I, I don't buy gold um, because I want to trade on higher inflation. I don't wanna buy gold to sell next year because I think inflation's gonna be higher. I wanna buy gold because it is gold. Because no matter what happens to the currency, it, you know, an ounce of gold is still an ounce of gold. And it can be used to make X, Y, Z number of rings or, or gadgets or, or whatever. It, it, it's a, one of the 92 naturally occurring chemical elements that has unique and distinct properties, and it has a certain value. Um, so it, it, you, and you look at it over not just decades, but centuries or thousands of years. And there's a, a famous thing. I can't uh, substantiate this, but it's often said that mm -hmm. one ounce of gold is roughly equivalent to the price of one really good suit across its millennia yep. or or something like three or four hundred loaves of bread or something like that. Right. And I just looked at the supermarket the other day, and I think that actually still holds true. So, Or several hundred Big gold? Macs. <laughs> or several hundred Big Macs. Actually, yes. If you, if you look at the noise, longer term, that the gold Big Mac ratio is flat actually says what I'm saying. A mm -hmm. Big Mac is a Big Mac, and you can eat it. An ounce of gold is an ounce of gold, and it has certain uses. That's the reason to own it, because it is real, and it doesn't change. Let's link this into the article that you wrote recently as to why you're a big, sorry, <laughs> I have Big Mac in my mind. <laughs> why you're a Big Mac proponent. No, you that's not what dude. I meant. Why you're, why you're a gold bug. <laughs> that's what I meant to say. The title of your article, I'm a gold bug because I've seen real inflation and devaluation. A great article. Tell us about a thumbnail for us. What's the summary here? Why are you still a gold bug? Uh, so sort of a running joke I used to have at Casey Research is that I was the cheap Mexican knockoff Doug Casey. You know, as he, he got older and he didn't like banging his head on these little old colonial tunnels and stuff. He'd send me in there to go kick the rocks for him. It's a, I, I made that joke myself. Doug never said that. Um, so the fact is I have family in Mexico. My mother's from Mexico. We spent a lot of time there when I was little. And that was where I first came across the idea of inflation. And I was quite the enterprising little <laughs> I was I was an obnoxious brat, uh, but I had garage sales and I did all kinds of things to try to raise money. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I wanted I, you know, my idea was to become a store owner. And then my mother explained to me about this concept of inflation, which was really quite high. This was the 70s in Mexico, which was the U.S. on steroids. Um, so long story short, I, you know, I understood as I was horrified. I immediately as soon as I could went to the bank and exchanged my pesos uh, for dollars that you know, I had earned. And not long afterwards, there was a devaluation. And, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was, it was literally on the order of a double overnight. Like bank yeah. holiday, next day, your money's worth half of what it was. And just like this feeling of like, oh my gosh, you know, saved by the bell from this devaluation. I'll never forget that. And then here's the kicker is this was 70s, early 70s, come back to the U.S. in 1979. And what's going on in the U.S. in, seven, in the late 70s? You know, super high inflation in the U.S. dollar. And that's what really got me to think that, you know, all these funny money pieces of paper, these fiat currencies, um, they're all untrustworthy. And that's when I started converting my lawnmower money, savings and so on, into silver. Okay. Blue. All right. Now, and uh, you, started, you started collecting coins and bars at a young age? How did you, how did you, <laughs> ETFs went around back then. <laughs> so uh... No ETFs, yes, coins. Uh, you know, I, the article says gold bug. But I wasn't uh, making enough money on my lawnmowers, and there weren't many fractional ways of owning gold. So it was pretty much silver for me at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, though, I, 
I converted earnings. Like that was my savings at the time. I converted mm-hmm. earnings to uh, silver coins, even you know pre sixty five junk silver, whatever I could at the coin shop. I was also a scavenger. I found out early that there was silver used in electronics. That's not a new thing. I remember finding uh, with a friend of mine, we found an old World War II radar set that had this oh, wow. slab of silver inside, like a pound of just wow. solid slab silver inside. A pound of silver, okay. So it was, it, was, it was kind of a fun treasure hunt. Nice, nice. All right. Well, uh, next time you go on these treasure hunts, have you ever, do you still go on these treasure hunts, Lobo? No, I, I, dumpster diving in Puerto Rico doesn't sound like much fun to me. Um, well, it sounds like a lot of fun <laughs> from here. <laughs> we don't have these experiences up, uh, up in Maybe Canada. I'll do a but... YouTube on that, David. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let us know, Lobo. Now, before we close off, we, we, I started by talking about fireworks. That's something you talked about offline. Now, uh, uh, give, us a, give us a synopsis. Don't, uh, let us, uh, don't keep us hang here. What are you talking about? Okay, so... <laughs> There's a lot going on. So real quick, there's been all this transitory talk, transitory, 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 and the, and the year base effects. We all understand that. But there are some really key numbers coming up soon. And the next CPI number, I think it's quite possible that since last month's was the peak year-on-year base effect, that yeah. the year numbers will uh, go into retreat. But watch the month-on-month change. Because ask yourself, has anything really gotten cheaper over the last month? No. Well, maybe lumber. But generally speaking, nothing's gotten cheaper. So the month-on-month CPI numbers, core CPI numbers, the numbers the Fed looks at, I think will tell a very strong story that should really send a few tremors of fear through the powers that be. So watch these numbers. It, it, you know, Discount the year-on-year changes. Look at the month-on-month changes. This could cause some real fireworks. We also have the Basel III um, mm-hmm. implementation coming up. If they don't delay it, that's interesting and a whole huge big topic. I, I don't subscribe to some of the grand visions of this that some people have put out there, but this is significant. There is a rule change coming and it is supposed to be implemented by the end of June and it will affect how banks treat and hold gold. And apparently, you know, the, uh, the, the World Gold Council and the M- LBMA sent a letter into the powers that be saying, hey, this is going to screw our business. We really, we need, uh, we need an exemption here. And if they don't get it, that, that could cause changes in the futures markets, which I think a lot of gold bucks would, uh, you know, maybe welcome. So that's interesting. I, I, I'm not going to predict how it's going to come out. The Basel III keeps getting delayed. Maybe maybe gets delayed again. Yeah, it's supposed but to be in July, be, right, the implementation? Uh, I understood June 28th was June the, 28th, yeah. Okay. Was the deadline for that particular rule. And we'll just have to see. The, uh, the, the regulation's been proposed in 2008, so it's been... Plenty, plenty well, of time overall, for the banks to get ready. So like, yeah. As I understand it, and I'm, I'm not a, a central bank expert, right? I'm not mm-hmm. one of those economists that's focused his life on central banks. So we probably get somebody more expert than me in here. But reading the same articles that you and our audience probably mm-hmm. have, I understand the overall implementation is scheduled for January next year. But this rule about, you know, your, your uh, the NIRC or whatever they call it, this, this rule about how you treat gold as reserves, um, that I understand is supposed to go into effect on June 28th, and mm-hmm. that does have an impact on, you know, the LBMA and the COMEX and how they account for their allocated and non-allocated, uh, I guess, reserves. I mean, they're not they're not a bank strictly speaking, so I could actually see them getting an exemption. But right now, it it could cause them some heartache, uh, which would be interesting. And you know, if their requirements were increased. Uh, I think most of us out there that would like to see better price discovery in the gold and silver markets would see that as a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, we'll look out for that. Thank you, Lobo. We'll follow up. And uh, finally, to close out the conversation, we'll talk about the gold price overall. Now, I see on your bookshelf there, The Intelligent Investor. I noticed that. Thank Graham's (laughs) book. I noticed the the cover there. Now, uh, and, and right ten- in front of it, my stacks. I, this is what I picked up on Silver Squeeze Day too. I haven't done any midnight gardening yet, yeah. uh, so it's it's still waiting disposition. But hey, I, I did my part. Okay, so anyway, Lobo, well, let's show this chart: uh, long-term silver and uh, long-term gold. So well, anyway, silver is about twenty-eight dollars right now. Uh, and gold has been, uh, well, this is, this is, uh, yeah, 
it, it, it's not yet not yet at uh, not yet breaching all time highs, but uh, we're, 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 we've seen a good pull up since early uh, since early March. Anyway, so the, the point I'm trying to make, Lobo, is that uh, prices are still historically speaking quite high compared to what yes. they were many years ago. So as an investor, you're looking at this, you can interpret this in one of two ways. Well, historically it's high, maybe it's due for a pullback, or historically it's high, uh, maybe this is a good opportunity to look for stocks, right? Maybe, 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 yes. maybe the gold and silver miners will benefit greatly from prices at these levels. What do you think? I think that's an excellent point. It's one I just made in my, uh, my free weekly uh, newsletter this Saturday went out. I, I think this is really important, David. People, they get all upset about the price and what it should be, what it isn't, you know, who's manipulating it, what's going on. And I understand that, you know, I, and I, I hate being ripped off, so I get that. But my job, what I'm trying to provide for your audience and mine, is guidance that helps us make money as speculators, as speculative investors. So I'm not here to debate the philosophy of the price discovery mechanism. What I'm saying, and what you've just shown on those charts, and if you look at the averages, I mean, look at look at gold, gold over $1,900, that's a great price. But you know, the average over the last year is around 1840. That's a yeah. fantastic gold price. Most of the gold mines in operation now, now, were designed at, a, at the $1,300 price, or, or even lower, and they're now mm -hmm. operating based on price assumptions that are way lower than what we're realizing now. And this isn't a peak. Okay, that you know, 1900 right now is a short-term peak, but the 1840 price I'm talking about, that's a year-long average. These guys make tons of money at that price. And 2450 for silver, people get all upset about silver not being higher. But the silver miners, the better ones, you know, they were they learned how to make money at less than $20 silver. And for it to average over 24 bucks for a year, that's a fantastic silver price for the business. You know, never mind, you know, the philosophy if the goal is to invest in good businesses that can see share price appreciation, if we're right about the metals prices going higher, then this gives us a tool. Look at who was able to make money over the last year, COVID and all. If they could survive all the ups and downs of 2020, that's a great tool for stock picking. And those companies will be poised to do even better if you know, if we're right about gold going higher, you know, I do expect gold to head up towards three thousand dollars before all is said and done. Maybe higher. I expect silver over one fifty, uh, maybe closer to two hundred before all is said and done. But those are peaks. the The longer term average price, we, we can make money there, and we can see which companies can make money there. We can see which exploration and development projects can make money where we are now. So there's opportunities to make money here that I think. People just don't do themselves a service if they get all, you know, bent out of shape over what the prices are or should be, instead of looking, you know, how can I invest where things are now? Well, if silver is at one hundred fifty dollars, I don't think you'll expect a pound of it in a radar detector. <laughs> no more treasure <laughs> hunting for you, Lobo. Everyone's going to be thrifting on silver. But uh, anyway, uh, great uh, thoughts. And where can people actually find out your stock picks? Sure. Well, thank you very much. Uh, independentspeculator.com is the place to come and see. And I'm not a tease, Dave, but I never tease, you know, and say, oh, sign up now and you'll get this, you know. I have the same prices all the time. Nobody gets a discount. I never give away picks for free. I do give away guidance and market observations, as you and I have been talking about. That's available in the free weekly digest. Um, but if you, if you want to do business with me, I welcome you. And there are plenty of links on the website for how you can sign up for my paid services. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Lobo, for your update this week, and uh, we'll look forward to speaking again soon. Thank you, David. And thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned for more.